speaker tonight, for a lot of you, you know already, uh, Matthias Schultz, he's our secretary and treasurer, and uh, he's also a historian with uh, PNIST. And with that, uh, that's about all my introduction I have for him. So, Matt. Short and sweet is sometimes the best. Okay, I've got to figure out wearing glasses for this is easier or not. Okay, the topic tonight, Operation Resupply, something that a lot of people have never heard of because it's lost in the shadows. But the Second World War brought us a better understanding of weather and weather systems. For instance, the jet stream was discovered during the Second World War, and also how the Arctic weather influences weather systems further south. <laughs> now, the North Atlantic ferry route required better weather forecasting, especially after the Second World War, because there were now a lot more civilian aircraft going across uh, the North Atlantic. And with paying customers on board, you didn't want to uh, have the aircraft disappear or be delayed too much. Now, such weather stations up in the Arctic, I found that they were recommended as early as 1923 by uh, squadron leader uh, R.A. Logan after his uh, 1922 trip to the Arctic. Now, a smaller consideration in all of this, but one that was to gain in importance, uh, was the requirement by the Americans for greater security. Now, the U.S. wanted to have a bit of a foothold in the Arctic, and the weathermen were a way of doing that without being overtly present. Now, the result of all of this was a plan to create nine Arctic weather stations, jointly manned by the U.S. and Canada. Hence the Joint Arctic Weather Stations, or JAWS as they were known. And there we go. Okay, so tonight I'll be talking about Operation Resupply. Now this was the RCF name for the twice annual mission to fly supplies up to two Arctic weather stations using Resolute Bay as a staging point. And I think it's important to highlight this operation because it's always been in the shadow of Operation Box Top, which started in 1956 and which was there to uh, resupply Alert and Eureka. And I'll highlight in this presentation what needed to be done to conduct the operation, as this was for the time a major undertaking for the RCAF. And I'll be looking at the period from 1950 to 1959 as I find this to be one of the more interesting uh, periods of the operation, how it was run. Now, I'll have to talk all the way back to 1946 as a lead-in. And I'll also talk about the aircraft that were used, the North Stars, and one of my favorites, the uh, flying box cars. Okay. Now, although the plan was originally to have nine stations, in the end, only five were created. Um, does the word money mean anything? Um, these five were Alert up here, uh, Eureka over here, Isaacson, Mold Bay, and Resolute Bay. And Churchill is all the way down over here somewhere. So it shows you just how far up in the Arctic these are. Now, Thule was the other resupply base. Um, it was a joint American-Danish weather station at the start, and then uh, later transformed into various other uh, roles. Now, a word on the name of the operations would be appropriate at this time, because Op Resupply was the name for the missions to the Arctic weather stations of Mold Bay and Isaacson. The U.S. Air Force was responsible for Eureka and Alert. Now, in 1956, the RCF assumed responsibility for resupplying Alert and Eureka, and this came now under a separate name, Operation Box Top, which continues to this day. And because of that, I think that resupply has been lost. Now, a quick word about the photos. The black and white ones are primarily RCAF from 1952. 
The color ones are from 1959. And I didn't really have much choice about the fact that there's so much snow in all of these photos. I think the uh, RCF photographers who went up there um, wanted to make this look like a really harsh and severe environment. Not that it isn't in some ways, but I couldn't find any photos of any of these places in the brief Arctic summer. Now, we have to go back to Operation Nanook. So the original work for the weather stations was, was laid down in an American operation in 1946. The U.S. planned the operation in isolation and only approached Canada about the plan in late May 1946. Canada agreed with several provisos, mainly related to Canadians going along. Uh, this operation was in the Canadian waters, as you can see, for just over a month. Now, this was a U.S. Navy operation, but the RCF sent along two observers. The U.S. Navy also supplied uh, the ships, as well as two Navy PBM Mariner flying boats that were carried on board. And the last four points noted here are the goals of the operation. Now, I find it funny the, oper the name Operation Nanook, and the only thing I can think of is that they named it after the 1922 documentary, The Nuke of the North. Now, I think there's also some irony that the Canadian Armed Forces, um, in the last couple of decades, has been doing ar Arctic sovereignty operations under the name Operation Nanook. So, we've actually taken an American name to go and apply our own sovereignty to the Arctic. I mean, there's a bit of irony there. Now, considering this was a joint operation, you would figure that it would have been formalized. An informal agreement was reached. I haven't found, and nobody has found a date for that yet. But, by 1949, after a series of negotiations, and not really getting anywhere, and then discovering that everything seemed to be going very, very well, they said, forget the formal agreement, we'll just run it as it is. So everybody was fine and happy with that. Now, part of the informal agreement was that Canada could at any time take over any of the American duties whenever it wished. And even though the Americans provided the initial transport and construction, the sites and structures would, however, remain Canadian. So even with this large American presence in the North, this was always Canadian sovereignty that was uh, being enforced in uh, many ways. So, when we consider resupplying the weather stations, there's many factors that had to be considered. Supplies were brought by ship to Resolute Bay and Thule, from which it was then distributed by air. Fuel and building supplies were the key items in the resupply, but there was canned goods, fresh food, lumber, last minute supplies, and more importantly, mail. And those last items, they would normally come through Churchill or Lachine, up to Resolute and then be uh, distributed. The sites were all built up slowly over time as the limits of the shipping and of the airlift operations prevented everything from being built up in one fell swoop. Interestingly enough, in terms of fuel, yes, you had avgas, you had diesel, you had cooking fuel, but there was also coal. And the only thing I can think of because I haven't found it written down anywhere, is that the coal was actually used for heating until that was uh, replaced. Now, there were two airlift times, one in the spring, usually around early April, and another in, uh, in the autumn, usually mid to late September, or even into October, depending on the conditions. Landing at each of the uh, airfields was contingent upon the pack ice or the quality of the land-based runway. At the better uh, developed sites, or as the sites became better developed through the 1950s, um, it was possible for landings to be made on the land-based airstrip in the summer and even throughout the winter. Now that's Thule's. Um, this is Mount Dundas, also known as Ball Cap Mountain, alongside which the airstrip runs. Uh, construction of the uh, airstrip 
began with the 1946 supply lift of Op Nanook. In 1951, it became uh, a strategic air command base. And in 1961, it became a ballistic missile early warning system. Or there was a site for that also located there. So it was quite a, uh, a busy site by the time you get to the uh, early 1960s. For the weather stations themselves, they typically had a team of eight at each site, posted there for one year. Besides the weathermen, there had to be support personnel, of which probably the cook was probably the best uh, thing that could ever happen there if you had a good one. Now, there'd also be general maintenance personnel who would keep the generators running, do electrical work, mechanical work, and uh, prepare the ice or the land runways. The commanding officer was always a Canadian from the Department of Transport, while the U.S. Weather Bureau provided the second in command. Normally there were no problems with this arrangement, but I did note a few instances in uh, some of the documents where the uh, American EXO was not overly thrilled at having to take orders from a uh, Canadian or being second fiddle. But I think that was more of a rarity than an actual uh, um, regular occurrence. Eureka! It appears to have been identified as a potential weather station in Opnanuk in 1946. In April 47, the U.S. flew men and supplies to start construction of the station. And in late uh, July 47, three U.S. Navy ships stopped at Eureka, dropped off more construction materials and more construction crews. Five James Way huts, prefab huts, were built as part of the original station. And it began operation on uh, the 1st of January, 48. Now, Resolute Bay was not the, uh, the first choice for the southern terminus of the airlift. Winter Harbor on Melville Island, which is, oops, sorry, which is over here, and Resolute is over here. Winter Harbor was originally selected in 46, but when the U.S. Navy ships tried to get there in 47 to drop off the supplies, the ice wouldn't let them, so they waited a bit. They finally gave up, headed east, and uh, they chose Resolute Bay. So the Americans started building an airstrip there right away, and in 1949, the RCF took over. Interestingly, in 1953, the government of Canada moved a group of four Inuit families from Hudson's Bay to Resolute as part of a, an effort to uh, increase Canada's sovereignty over the Arctic. Now, the original uh, location for the Inuit uh, village was about five kilometers from uh, the RCF station, but I understand it's now uh, a lot closer. And interestingly enough, the government, up to 1946, or sorry, 56, had actually planned to move Inuit to alert Eureka, Isaacson, and Mold Bay as well. So all of the five stations were being considered as uh, having Inuit families. Unfortunately, that's the best photo I could find of uh, Isaacson. Um, he was chosen on the basis of a U.S. Air Force uh, recce from Resolute in the spring of uh, 1948. It was quickly built up, supplied by an airlift from Resolute, and began operations, surprisingly enough, on the 3rd of May, 1948. It was rebuilt with better structures in 1958, and was finally closed in 1978 as a uh, cost-cutting measure with uh, weather observations being uh, automated. Oh, and that really snowy photo, that was the operations building and the sleeping quarters in March 1947, and this is while the rebuild is underway in 1958. Mold Bay was also chosen on the basis of an air recce from Resolute in 48, and again within a matter of weeks, a large American airlift flew in the building materials, and on the 14th of May, 48, it was already operating and sending reports. So all this was happening very, very quickly. It too was uh, automated, but uh, this was in 1997.
Alert. The location for Alert was discovered by an American PBM uh, mariner in uh, an air recce flight from uh, Thule in 1946. The supplies were dropped off by the U.S. Navy uh, ship Adisto and the U.S. Coast Guard ship Eastwind in August 1948. The supplies included a T-9 bulldozer. We'll get to that in a second. Now, construction was supposed to start in 1949, but because of a shortage of aircraft for the Berlin airlift, and the RCF not having enough aircraft to even consider something like this, and the ice problems, construction of Alert was delayed until 1950. And the T-9 bulldozer, it started up without too much issue after two frozen years, and helped build the first ice strip, which was actually on uh, the ice. Now, in 1947 and 48, there were uh, two U.S. Navy missions to the Arctic that helped build up the, uh, the four weather stations. In 49, the uh, USN held Opnanuk 2, which brought in more supplies. Canada had limited involvement in all three of those years. It was mostly RCN and RCF observers, and the most visible aspect of the RCF during these uh, three years was Lancaster's flying ice wreckies on behalf of uh, the RCF in support of the U.S. Navy. Now, it wouldn't be until 1950 that the uh, RCF would become more involved, and that was the first year that they assisted with the resupply missions. They sent a couple of crew up with the USAF to learn how they operated. Interestingly enough, weather forecasts for the uh, area of the Arctic originated from Edmonton. So even though you had Resolute, which was a weather station, weather forecast came from Edmonton. Uh, this created obvious problems and was changed the next year when they originated in Resolute. Now, Resolute was a small station at the time, limited facilities. A 408 squadron photo that was already there using the facilities. So the uh, 426 squadron crews and servicing personnel as you can see, they really had to, uh, to rough it, you know, air mattresses, sleeping bags, and tents. Op resupply, 1950. 426 uh, squadron provided one North Star and a small servicing crew. Their first load was to Isaacson, and the last to alert where they landed on the ice strip. The operation lasted 39 days but sorties were only possible on 31 of those. And this is about average for all future operations. And even though op resupply was for Isaacson and Mold Bay, the aircraft flew wherever they were needed. So if there was an urgent uh, set of supplies that needed to get to Eureka, you flew up to uh, Eureka. Or if Mold Bay or Isaacson were snowed in, well, you uh, did another airlift. With the autumn airlift in October, after it was completed, there was still 180 tons of supplies to lift to Isaacson and Mold Bay. So the RCF planned on doing this by having one flight a month from Resolute to these two stations. Now, this would become a regular event in what the RCF called the cleanup, but which in the future would be conducted over a matter of several weeks, either in May or towards late October. Now, the normal size of the RCF uh, airlift detachment was three air crew and two aircraft plus 27 ground crew. And this didn't include the, uh, the ice recce detachment. And this was when uh, there were two or three aircraft operating. That was the standard size of the detachment. Now, an operation of this size uh, doesn't happen overnight. Uh, from the start, Air Transport Command would hold its meetings on the coming springtime operation in November or December of the prior year, so about four or five months in advance. Now, it would also include a review of what they had done that year so they could take those lessons and employ them for the upcoming operation. And the op order would actually be issued sometime in the March time frame. 
1954, the Department of Transport took over the supply uh, uh, by ship to Resolute Bay. Now, this required new planning between the RCF and the Department of Transport as to what would be supplied, what services would be required by the DOT ships. For instance, when they got to Resolute, they usually needed a uh, resupply of uh, fresh water, which the RCF would provide. The first such meeting occurred in December 53, followed by another in uh, January 54. And the DOT op order was issued in May for an operation that would start in July with the loading of the ships in Montreal. And this was pretty well the next, uh, or the schedule for the next uh, two decades for these, uh, for these uh, shipborne uh, lifts. What this also meant was that the spring airlift, being the main one, planning for that one had to take place prior to the shipping resupply of the prior year. In other words, the cargo for the April 1955 airlift was already being planned in January 1954. So they're always working at least uh, a year and a bit in advance. Now, as I mentioned, the RCF was responsible for conducting ice recce's for the U.S. Navy and DOT task forces that dropped off supplies to Resolute and Thule. From 50 to 53, they were under the uh, control of uh, the U.S. Uh, task force. After that, it was uh, the uh, DOT. And as you can see, all the R RCF Lancaster squadrons took part in op resupply, uh, primarily using Resolute, but uh, in some years, they would also use uh, Thule as their uh, base of operations for a short period of time. Now, fortunately, there were accidents. And as you're probably aware, one of the Lancasters involved in the ice recce missions was involved in a crash that killed nine in uh, alert, seven RCF crew and uh, two civilians. What happened was that when spark plugs were needed to keep the T-9 dozer operating, Wing Commander French volunteered to conduct the drop of the plugs and some other supplies, including mail. After conducting one sweep over the airfield to check on wind and the situation on the ground, the Lancaster came around and the canister and parachute were tossed out. Unfortunately, the chute ta tangled with the uh, tail and caused the aircraft to crash into a the ground about 500 meters from the airfield. And this is an actual picture of the fireball. There was somebody who was taking photos at the time and captured this. And for those who are wondering, yes, they were able to recover the canister and they got the spark plugs that they needed to keep everything running. Now, there were other accidents in the resupply of the weather station. And some of these go to pilot error. Um, at Isaacson on, uh, in October 49, a U.S. Air Force C-47 crashed at takeoff at the weather station. Ice had built up on the wings overnight. The plane was overloaded. There was 12 centimeters on the ground. So the plane never actually really got up into the air, and it just kept on skidding and uh, went for uh, anywhere uh, between three quarters to one kilometer along uh, the ice. Um, ten people on board, all of whom survived with minor scrapes and bruises. And the passengers included uh, two U.S. Uh, Weather Bureau employees, a Canadian uh, meteorologist, and an RCMP constable. And this is the actual uh, Dakota. And in October 52, a USAF uh, C-54 with a load of fuel drums was coming in to land at alert. It landed short, destroying the aircraft, but luckily causing no casualties among the crew, and there was no fire on board. Uh, the wreckage was just unloaded and uh, left exactly where it was, and it's still there today. Now, the RCF wasn't isolated from its own uh, accidents. In April 54, a boxcar hit a heavy snowdrift while landing at Mole Bay. The drift had occurred overnight, frozen solid at that time, and uh, it was like a small little concrete wall when the aircraft landed. It tore off one of the uh, 
fact, it was a port landing gear. Further flights to Mold Bay in uh, May helped repair the aircraft and uh, it was flown out. The lesson for the RCF was that there should be someone at each airstrip to check on the runway conditions, and this is what they did in uh, the Autumn 54 mission in 55, but I'm not sure about that, whether they did that also in further years. And in September 57, 436 Squadron, uh, a boxcar was coming in to land at Isaacson, and it landed four, four feet short of the runway. Now we think, ah, four feet doesn't really matter much. But when you consider that everything around, the runway was unimproved. It tore off both of the landing gear, and it uh, slid along in its belly. Thankfully, this was the last flight to Isaacson of the uh, Autumn Resupply Mission, so they just left the aircraft there. They sent in repair teams over the course of the winter, and it was flown out in uh, the spring. So both 435 and 436 Squadron have uh, an equal share of uh, accidents in uh, opera supply. So it was an equal opportunity situation. And that is what the runway looks like, or the area outside of the runway. So th there are photos of where the landing gear actually impacted but the quality isn't good enough to put up here. But this is a photo from just a slightly different angle. You can see what a, what a mess this is. Now, in 1951, the RCF took full operational control of Operation Resupply. Now, they didn't have enough aircraft to take over all of the sorties necessary. So the USAF assisted with Alert and Eureka, and that would be the case until 1956. Interestingly enough, the USAF, um, from 1950 onwards, would only use four-engine aircraft on their resupply, resupply flights, whereas the RCF was happy to go and use the, uh, the twin-engine uh, boxcar. Now, having looked at what's done, um, to get the mission going, it's worth noting how it was actually done on the ground. So the loading of a North Star began with the transfer of cargo from sleds to the aircraft. Now, wheeled forklifts may have been useful in the colder periods, but they weren't as maneuverable on the snow, and they failed completely during the brief Arctic summer when the ground gets a little soft. And Resolute Bay, the big complaint there seemed to always be the forklifts aren't working, we need more forklifts. And this was in 52, 53, you know, it was right up to 59. Now, loading was done by hand with supplies being manhandled to the aircraft because of the uh, side door loading. Uh, as you can see, besides forklifts, trucks were also used to transfer uh, the boxes to the North Stars. And you'll note that the bottom of the truck bed is still below the level of the North Star's floor, which required all these boxes to be manhandled into the uh, aircraft. Now, in this photo taken at Isaacson, you can see the difficulty um, of unloading large, bulky items. In this case, it's a Herman Nelson heater. Um, you can see all the dry goods that are, uh, or possibly it's all dry goods, stored in the boxes beside the aircraft. And what you cannot see um, is that the starboard engines are probably still running because they were afraid that if they ever shut the engines down and with the length of time it took to unload the aircraft, they were afraid they might not be able to get any of the engines started again. And just as a, a feature of joy for these poor guys, can you imagine lugging 100-pound sacks of coal off of the airplanes and throwing them onto the ground? And, oh, you can also see the, the tractor in the, the background, which would have a sled behind it, because all of this was put onto sleds and then hauled off. Now, at Resolute, fuel drums were stored some distance from the tanks that were used to refuel the aircraft. The drums were moved by tractor and sled, and just to give you an idea, they would usually put in just under 45 gallons and that would be imperial gallons. Um, and in 1955 alone, they had 
380,000 gallons of AV gas plus 245,000 of diesel brought in just to uh, keep uh, the station's resupply. So that's an awful lot of uh, drums that would get refilled. Once at the airfield, the fuel had to be pumped into the tanks. However, not all of the drums could be emptied into one of the uh, tanks that they had there. There was just too much fuel and not enough tanks. So some was retained in the, uh, the drums, and in some cases, they would actually have to drain a tank. In one case, it was because of contaminated fuel, and put the fuel back into the drums. Now, all of this later took a turn for the better when they finally laid a pipe that went from what they, you could call a harbor, and it took the fuel up to the tanks, and additional tanks had been built. And I find this one interesting. Any guesses as to what's being hauled? Toilet. No, well, not quite. It's before that. Um, it's water. The tank itself was heated, and in Resolute it would have a hose attached to it to create bubbles so that the water wouldn't freeze. Up in Alert, they got water from Dumbbell Lake the same way up until the early 1960s when they built a pipe. But there, the water would be heated and have the bubbler going right away because from the time they dragged the water from Dumbbell Lake to the station, it would already have been pretty well frozen. I'd say 1953 was a pretty big year for the RCF and Opry Supply. They began to provide more personnel to the operation, and one of the first uh, additions was the Bull Gangs, about whom I'll say a little more in a minute. Um, in 1954, the, in, uh, the RCF introduced a beach master, and also saw the introduction of a new aircraft, the flying boxcar, into uh, Opry Supply Service. So one of the main tasks of the bull gangs was to dig out the fuel drums and then load them onto sleds. Those that were empty, they would have to then go and take to have them all cleaned out, brought down to the beach, and then they would be loaded onto a landing craft medium to be taken out to, uh, to the vessels that were there. The fun part about this was they picked 30 junior RCF airmen from RCF station uh, Lachine and employed them. Um, usually it was about 4,500 drums, but in some cases because of either time constraints or ice conditions, the ships had to move and the drums weren't loaded. So there were now 9,000 drums to be loaded the next year. They were also responsible for moving the drums from one area to another because they decided that ab gas would go over here and diesel would go over there, and then there's always moving around. The bull gangs also help with preparing buildings for painting, set up the base for uh, new buildings, and help with uh, general maintenance. But they did get to ride up there on the North Star. Now, I apologize for that photo. It's from the 1960s, but I couldn't resist this one because there was actually a debate within Air Transport Command as to whether the fuel drums should be laid on their end, as you saw in the previous photo where they were sort of dug in, or should they be laid on their side. I think laid on the side was the one they decided upon simply because they figured it had the least amount of wastage or fuel draining out of them. And it wasn't just the bull gangs that did uh, the work. Here, Corpor Corporal Wally Bridges, who was a safety systems specialist, is hand pumping methane from a barrel into the tank of the aircraft. So there was a lot of cross training being done up here because the RCF tried to keep the detachments fairly small, actually as small as possible. So everybody had a chance to be doing something different. Now, the Beachmaster came from Station Lachine in 1954, 
And you can see that his duties uh, were quite important and uh, fairly large. It should be noted that civilian stevedores offloaded the cargo vessels and the landing craft onto the beach. And then in, DO in 54, the DOT moved the supplies from the beach up to the airfield. But it appears that it was only for that year because from what I can see from 55 onwards, the RCF became responsible for moving everything from the beach up to uh, the airstrip and to the uh, DOT weather station. Now, in these first three or so years of flying, there were uh, a number of lessons that were learned. And one of the first one was that the maps of the areas were, where they were flying were often wrong. So the elevations noted for mountains was below what they actually weighed, were, for instance, on the way to alert. So the mountains were actually higher than what was stated on the maps, which could have unfortunate circumstances. They also had to pay very close attention to the weather forecasts. Um, any of these weather stations could be socked in very quickly, and it often happened that an airplane flew, and then half an hour from landing had to turn around and head back to Resolute because all of a sudden the visibility or the ceiling was under limits. As I'd already mentioned, there was the issue of uh, the cold weather starts. And interestingly enough, at least one member on each crew had to be qualified um, either on the RCF or the USAF winter bush survival course. And for April 1950, because the RCF didn't have a course at that time, they actually took the uh, USAF course in Goose Bay. Now, I mentioned earlier that there were supplies brought up from uh, Lachine and uh, Churchill. So not all everything came by ship. Mail, fresh food, especially meat, fruit and vegetables, and other items that were either urgently required or unfortunately thought of at the last minute were all flown up. Sometimes it would be on a shuttle run between Churchill, where they had a railhead, and Resolute, or when the aircraft were flying from Lachine or from uh, Edmonton, they would end up uh, passing through Churchill and bringing supplies that way. And, oh, you can't see it on here. It's, I think it's better in the next photo. Um, these are two caterpillar graders that are being loaded onto a North Star at Churchill, and they've been brought up by rail. So, can you imagine trying to wrestle those into the aircraft? Um, there was a small electric winch that did help them for stuff like this, but for some of the larger items, um, it became quite awkward. And yes, that is uh, Caterpillar. So this is not an advertisement, though, for uh, Caterpillar tractors. And one of the uh, graders was bound for Isaacson, and one of them for Mold Bay. And why they had to take them from Churchill to Resolute and didn't pack them on the ships, I have no idea. I couldn't find that. Now, in 54, the DOT took over responsibility for resupplying through Resolute Bay. Uh, this was part of their annual resupply of other isolated uh, DOT, RCMP um, outposts, Inuit uh, uh, villages that uh, the government had created. And five ships were uh, tasked as part of Operation Norse 1. And these were the new Canadian icebreakers, Gieberville and uh, C.D. Howe, and the older uh, N.B. McLean. There was one freighter, the SS Gander Bay, and a tanker, the uh, M.V. Maruba. And while the Gieberville went up to Eureka to drop off supplies there, the Howe went to Churchill and later escorted uh, the Gander Bay and uh, Maruba to Resolute. Now, at Resolute, the supplies will be offloaded onto a landing craft medium, or three what they call dumb barges, which were barges that needed to have a tug tow them, or they also had five self-propelled 10-ton ten ten barges. So they had quite a lot of uh, ships to quickly move supplies from, uh, from the ships to the, uh, the beach. Operation Norse 2 was in 55, and then they decided that in order to uh, avoid confusion, they just would start naming them Operation Norse and then the year. 
And this continued on right into the 1960s. Now, somebody was thinking, because when the Deberville and Howe were built, they put on a landing deck for helicopters and a hangar on the uh, Deberville, and they added one later on the Howe. Now, the U.S. Navy had been using the Bell uh, B-47s to do uh, short-range ice reccees during Op Nanook 2 in 1949, and then again in uh, Nanook 1950, and there they were used about 80 hours in all of that. And in 54, with the uh, Canadian uh, Coast Guard, or actually it was at that time Department of Transport ships, um, they were used for checking the leads in the ice to see if they could find anything through which the ships could then go. And at Eureka, they actually used the uh, helicopters for doing uh, vertical replenishment. So if they had something light, hook it up to, the, uh, to a sling on the helicopter and sling it over to the station. And this is the uh, Deberville, and you can see uh, where the helicopter is about to uh, lift off. Now, 1954 uh, also had significant changes to op resupply. Um, in 53, with the boxcar now being introduced, 426 Squadron's role began to be reduced, and in 54 it was reduced even further because 436 Squadron now joined the operation. Now, 426, their primary role now became bringing up personnel such as the Beachmaster, the bull gangs, um, the uh, civilian uh, stevedores. In some years, they participated in the, uh, the cleanup. And occasionally, there was also flying up during the off season to pick up somebody who was uh, quite ill at one of the weather stations and fly them either to Thule or to uh, Resolute. Um, after Alert became a radio listening post or a SIGINT or spy station, whichever you want to call it. They flew up there quite regularly. It started off as once a month uh, to pick up the tapes of the intercepted radio transmissions that had been uh, recorded that came from the Soviet Union. 435 Squadron, they weren't any strangers to the Arctic because they had been doing um, places such as Coral Bay, Copper Mine, all those places they had been uh, visiting quite regularly from uh, the time that uh, they started operations in uh, first in Edmonton and then uh, Nemeo. I think the RCF decided that they weren't going to use the Dakotas because for the Arctic Ops, they were too small, didn't have the range and the payload, so they didn't use them whatsoever. Now with the boxcar, you finally had an aircraft that did have those two features. And in the spring of 53, 435 provided two aircraft and four crews. The reason being that with the Arctic summer, the aircraft could be kept running 24-7 because one crew would do 12 hours on and then was 12 hours off and vice versa. In 54, 435 Squadron became the primary um, a support squadron for the operation. And they normally provided two to four aircraft, um, two in the autumn and four in the spring. 435 would usually, or sorry, 436 would usually provide half of that amount. The other thing that 435 would uh, do with all of this is, again, Isaacson and Mold Bay, and occasionally Alert and uh, Eureka. And as I mentioned before, they had the, uh, the Mold Bay uh, accident. Now, 436 Squadron was only reformed on the 1st of April, 1953. Um, they were supposed to only receive two flying box cars that year, but uh, they received three. So they were able to go up into the Arctic, but they didn't participate in Operation Resupply in 53. Now, they did in the 54 airlift. They were always in support of uh, 435 Squadron, but there was the occasional year where they would uh, take over entirely either the autumn or the spring one if uh, 436 was uh, 
heavily tasked with some other items or some other operations. And it wasn't just a squadron effort. Uh, you had the Lancaster squadrons, yes, the transport squadrons, but Station Lachine was also heavily involved because they did all of the planning for the RCF supplies to get to the Montreal docks and then be loaded onto the aircraft. You had number one and two air movement unit that put the supplies onto the pallets by, um, by station most of the time. There was the occasional pallet that was misdirected or supplies on the pallets. They weighed them and then loaded them onto the aircraft. And then other individuals were tasked from other RCF stations and squadrons, mostly navigators, but there was also uh, air traffic controllers because when you're running 24-7, you do need to have more than just that one air traffic controller that Resolute normally had. So the 54 operation, Isaacson, they had to use the uh, ice strip because the land strip wasn't uh, in any condition to be used. And in Mole Bay, it was completely the opposite. The stuff that was brought up, the fuel oil and uh, barrels, prefab huts, lumber, freight, Passengers, and as always, mail. And just to show you how much easier it is to load the boxcar than it is to load the, uh, the North Star, you can see how easy it is to load uh, the drums on board. It was certainly a lot easier than uh, trying to manhandle these onto the North Star. Now, it wasn't just ease of loading that uh, you had. There was actually a competition that developed between 435 and 436 squadron crews to see who could unload their boxcar the fastest. So what would happen would be, as soon as the airplane landed, either Isaacson or Mole Bay, two guys would run out, they would start to open up the, the clam doors, the navigator and the uh, radio operator would start to untie all of the loads, and then the pilots and there were two of them, would start pushing everything out. And I'd have to say both of them were winners because they were within a few seconds of each other and the fastest unloading time was about three and a half minutes. Now the loaders were on one and two AMUs. As I said, they would prepare the pallets. They worked 12 hours on, 12 hours off, so they could have the airplanes operating 24-7. Now, normally one aircraft would make three or even four flights a, a day. And as I mentioned, it was unusual for an aircraft that, as it got towards its destination, it had to turn around. What would happen would be the poor ground crew would then have to unload everything and put supplies on for another airfield. So it could be uh, quite interesting, quite tiring for them. Now, I don't know if you can read that, but that one there says Carling and these, oh, Carling, and uh, there's uh, O'Keefe up here. Now, another important supply item that went to Resolute was beer. In 54, it was 3,105 cases. Um, in 55, it was only 1,520. Um, the RCF had a problem though because in the 54 uh, lift by C, 98 cases were lost, mostly through pilferage. Um, none were damaged when they were being unloaded and uh, taken ashore. So in 55, um, the RCF made sure that there was much better security for the beer. So it was carefully guarded in Montreal and then upon arrival at Resolute, and somehow still 26 cases disappeared. So the loss was absorbed, or shall we say, written off by non-public funds. Um, and just as an example of the desire for uh, something to help smooth the end of the day, um, when Alert was being built, they discovered that there was an illegal still in operation there in 1950. Now, whether it was American or Canadian, um, they never did discover. Now, this is uh, an arrival at uh, Eureka. 
in uh, April 59. And the first airplane in was always very well greeted because, yes, it brought mail, it brought fresh food, but it usually brought your replacement as well. So this was your chance to welcome them. And uh, my understanding is some people actually disappeared on that flight out, while others uh, did stay around and uh, do a small uh, turnover. Mold Bay. Um, you can see there are some fuel drums there, deep in the background. A flying boxcar could hold approximately 25 fuel drums. So when they were moving in the neighborhood of 2,000 or more, that's an awful lot of uh, flights they had to make. So, and yet Mold Bay again. And if you notice, the fuel drums over here, they were just simply rolled off and left to the side. And uh, they had the, uh, the guard dog. And then later when the aircraft left, they would go and uh, load those drums onto, uh, onto a sled and tow it with a tractor over to uh, their fuel storage area. Now, besides Operation Resupply, there were other JAWS flights. Um, Merry Christmas, or as it was called, Operation Santa Claus, and that was the actual name of the operation. Um, it was usually done in the full moon just before Christmas, so on some occasions it was done in late November, early December, and 435, 436, and 426 all participated in these, and there's usually 21 um, of these isolated stations, RCMP, weather stations, and others, and they received a Christmas tree by parachute, mail, some fresh food. Now, I don't know whether that included turkey, but I have seen references to Christmas pudding being among the, uh, the food that was dropped to them. And usually it was split between 435 and 436 squadron, uh, 435 taking the western half of the Arctic, and 436 doing the eastern half, which mostly was Hudson's Bay and Labrador. Now, as uh, the airstrips in the north started to improve, um, the RCF created, or they extended, service flights number five outbound and number six inbound to pick up uh, and uh, drop off passengers and mail. And even though 426 was the main squadron involved in this, 435 was involved in the earlier years of this. And then 436 in uh, 1960, when 426 became involved in uh, the Congo operation. And as I mentioned earlier with Alert, as soon as it became a SIGINT station, there were monthly flights, and then the regularity picked up in 1960 so that uh, there were weekly flights into uh, Alert. <coughs> so what do we get out of all of this? Well, there was commercialization. Um, at the time Operation Resupply started, the RCF was the only organization capable of providing that level of support to the weather stations. But as commercial airlines increased their operations in uh, the north, um, by the late 1960s they had uh, taken over from the RCF, but I haven't found the exact date yet. Operation Box Top, which had started in 56, remained a military operation, however, and that was because with the recovery of those SIGIN tapes, they weren't going to trust that to a civilian airline. Operation Resupply taught the RCF how to operate in the extreme north. Um, there was issues with navigation. Um, one thing I didn't mention was, in one case, a boxcar had an issue with its heating, and as a result, everything froze over, and, except for a small patch where the pilots could look out. The navigator, couldn't uh, look out and take uh, sun lines to chart where he was going. And by the time they were finally able to pick up a radio beacon to figure out where they were, they discovered that instead of going from Resolute to um, Isaacson, they were actually on their way to um, um, Inuvik. Thankfully, they were able to detect that in time and they were able to turn around and make it to uh, Isaacson. But they also discovered there that you're going to have to use a Class A navigator instead of a, um, a Class C one on these uh, operations. 
So it helped to open up the, uh, the north. Um, a lot of these uh, places, if you look in uh, some of the uh, books about the, uh, the bush pilots, you'll see that they were using places like Mold Bay and Eureka to, uh, to, to land, drop off scientists. It helped establish Canada's uh, claims uh, to the north. Um, if it wasn't for the transport aircraft, it would have been very difficult for the Canadians to have any modicum of sovereignty claims over uh, the Arctic, because the Americans would have, I think, literally uh, taken over. Um, the, the shortage of transport aircraft also affected the RCAF in the early years. They only had the North Star. And I think that's about all we can take away from the operation during uh, the 1950s. Are there any questions? <coughs> When, when they uh, um, set up these stations, or take the location of the stations, I, I suppose there was obvious questions like access, could they have a runway, and all this kind of business, but there was, was there any, did you come across any criteria that, that would make a good weather station? Like why, or do you just want to spread them out in a line spaced apart or something? Well, I haven't found where the other four were supposed to go, but they had picked these on the basis of it provided a nice arc right around the, uh, the Arctic. Because Thule also had the weather station, and then you also had uh, uh, Breslau, which was in the middle. You had Frobisher Bay, so there, was a, well, there was a weather station. So there was a nice scattering of that. In terms of criteria, basically, they did an aerial reconnaissance. They looked, took photographs, and said, ah, this looks like a good spot. It looks like it's got a lake nearby for fresh water. It's got a flat area for a runway, and for some of them they figured, oh, it looks like it's ice free at this time of the year, which for Winter Harbor um, didn't turn out to be the case. I'll just toss in a few other photos. Um, I just like these photos. But it was only afterwards, after they had actually picked the site and actually started construction work, that for instance they would send in a geologist to look at the, st uh, the stability of the soil and other engineers to go and see if this was going to be a long-term weather station. So it was only after they had started all of this that they decided to check to see if it would be okay to build here. You. Those gangs that were sent up from Lachine, mm -hmm. about how many were, were in them and were they, did they sort of winter over or were they in and out? No, there, there were normally about uh, 30 of them. But in 1958, because it was a much larger airlift that year, they actually had 50. And they would send up a, a small group of them, usually about a third, um, to Resolute about uh, two weeks before the operation commenced, or before it was scheduled to, uh, uh, to commence. And they would do all of uh, the, or start doing some of the work. Then when uh, the resupply actually started from the uh, from the ships to the beach. That's when they really took uh, took over and uh, were coordinated by the beach master. And then, as soon as all of this was over, back they flew to Lachine. So they were not on the they were not drawing on the, the base supplies in the winter. No, it was only for that short period of time that uh, the resupply from the ships actually took place. Gotcha. So this is all preparations uh, for a flight. Yes? Uh, eventually the Jaws turned into Hawes. Uh, do you recall what years the various stations changed over? I believe it was 1972, because that was when the, uh, the Americans uh, left. Hawes? High Arctic Weather Station. Stations. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> yes. uh, you, there's a question up here? Oh, yes? Uh, in the case of the result in the, the uh, fireball, Killed? Yeah, there were all seven, including the CO of the squadron who was uh, flying at the time. Were there any other casualties? Or any other um, there were two casualties, um, both American civilians. I can't remember who one was, but the other one was one of the prime movers in getting the uh, the Jaws stations uh, formed, and uh, and was a retired. I think U.S. Army weatherman. Uh, 
Yeah, um, the box car. So, how how did that perform in that job? I've heard kind of stories that that was some people didn't think it was a great uh, lifter. So, how how did they like it? I mean, did, was it capable to do it? Was it? Um, yeah, the question was. There's been a lot of comments about the capabilities of the boxcar because people are saying it didn't have the range, it was underpowered. Um, so how did the crews who flew them up there like them? Um, did you, I haven't seen anything on that. The like maintenance them. on them. I uh, liked them. Oh, you did? Yeah. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> it was not an easy airplane, but it was a lovely airplane. Uh, Built by uh, uh, built the cockpit was built around the crew. It was very very comfortable, but it had its uh, its drawbacks. Uh, the engine in the winter had a habit of uh, getting carbising, so the navigator had to work uh, probably three times as hard as anywhere else because you had to figure the point of no returns and the, the critical points of the various stations and keep how it goes in charts very up to date and it, but it was a challenge and it was fun. I would imagine that, that rear loading facility too was considered a real uh, plus <coughs> compared to the side loading of a North Star. Oh it made things so much easier. I mean you can just see how there was no way to maneuver some of the larger loads into the North Star. I mean how they managed to get those frames for the graders in still has me uh, shaking my head. But yeah, it's interesting what you said because you won't find that in uh, the mission reports because after every uh, um, autumn and uh, springtime mission, a report would be done. And the pilot's reports would always indicate um, how good the fields were and issues that arose from the actual flying. But nobody ever really commented on the aircraft and even in the maintenance reports. Um, the biggest thing there was, uh, we should have brought this up. But I did notice that um, starting, I believe it was in 56, they always kept an aircraft on standby, either at um, Downsview or uh, in uh, Nemeo, because there was always one aircraft that decided it was going to have an engine breakdown and they had to change an engine. So that aircraft would come up, bring the engine, Poor crews would have to then go and do a uh, engine switch up in Resolute, and I mean, I saw the temperature listed as minus 18, but I'm not sure if that's Celsius. I think that was Fahrenheit. So either way you look at it, that's bloody cold to be changing an engine where there's no hangers. So there were uh, certainly challenges uh, on the maintenance side for that. Anyhow, thank you very much. I hope you were. Uh, Thank you very much, Matt.